Portland Psychedelic Society and Oregon Psilocybin Society are proud to announce Paul Stamets speaking at the Newmark Theater in Portland, Oregon, September 20th. Tickets go on sale July 24th. Let's have a big round of applause for you coming out. Thank you. I'm Charles. I'm a volunteer with the Portland Psychedelic Society. We are a volunteer-run organization that is bringing psychedelic medicine, insight, and culture to Portland. Thank you all for coming out. How many here, show of hands, uh, this is your first time coming? Wow. Well, let's give a big round of applause for you guys. Thank you for taking the first step on your journey, appropriately enough for tonight's event, charting your trip, finding the right guide for your entheogenic journey. Now, before we get started on the stage, just a few uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, first of all, the Paris Theater is very generous by allowing us to do this on a, on a uh, donation basis. So we do ask that everybody here please uh, get at least one drink tonight. We have non-alcoholic options available. Please tip your bar staff. Uh, they will appreciate it, and it will help us to continue to bring more of these events. And last but not least, they deserve a round of applause because they have to deal with a lot of drunks at the end of the night. So thank you for helping us start it. Uh, because we are a volunteer group, uh, we are all putting in our time out of passion. However, there are costs associated with creating events, and we're going to be bringing some great speakers out. So Brooks here, who is a volunteer with the group, is going to be going around with a donation jar. We ask you, please donate what feels right to you. Please donate how you value psychedelic medicine, how you value free education here in Portland, Five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you would pay to go to an event at a music club would be appropriate here. Um, even if you just got to dig for change because that's what you can afford, that's okay too. But we're going to pass this around and ask everybody to please contribute what they're able to as it goes around with Brooks. And finally, before we start, uh, Helen, our founder here. Thank you, Helen. She is uh, managing our table over there where we have special Portland Psychedelic Society shirts available for donation. Uh, these are available for $20 donations each. This is the last time they're going to be $20. they are going to have to go up after that because we're running low on our inventory. So don't miss out. Uh, don't be caught in the web of supply and demand. Please contribute uh, 20 bucks tonight to get your amazing shirt and show your psychedelic pride. Uh, Joe Eden, one of our panelists, has also uh, offered some of his personal library of psychedelic books to browse. We are bibliophiles here, so we take it very seriously. The books don't walk away, but please do feel free to take a look at that. Uh, as I mentioned, I am Charles, and I'm going to stop talking now and get to the real attraction of why we're here tonight, our experts. And I'm going to ask our experts to please uh, take a moment to introduce themselves, uh, their relationship with the medicines, and uh, what they have to offer you tonight, and then we'll get into our presentation. So starting with Joe. There's a mic right there, Joe. Hi. Hi. Is that good? Hi, I'm Joe. Um, Hang on. A little closer? All right. Um, I've been in the business of counseling, treating people for about 35 years. I'm more or less retired at this point. Um, I'm part of the original 1960s um, crowd who uh, ruined it for everyone else, according to some people. Um, and, and I'm very, very happy to be back in the business of helping people to explore. Thank you, Joe. Hi. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm Elizabeth Price. Joe is my clinical supervisor. This is my 20th year in the field. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology. I've spent 15 years doing crisis work. Um, I have a personal knowledge of psilocybin and cannabis since my early 20s, and I'm now 48. Um, in my clinical training, one of the things I believe I can offer is there are certain groups of people with certain psychiatric experiences that probably should not partake of this medicine. Um, and I have a, a very discerning eye for helping people sort out if they're one of those people that we should rule out, if you will. Um, I have three years uh, working with people professionally who call themselves or consider themselves psychonauts or people who use entheogens for their well-being. Um, and I suppose what I'd like you to know about my perspective is that I feel I have a deep understanding for um, all sorts of 
uh, intersections around our social psychology and programming, whether it's our story of age or race or gender or uh, religious orientation. So thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Barnett. I'm a, <clears throat> a licensed uh, clinical social worker, uh, currently with a private practice here in town in Northwest Portland. And um, <clears throat> I have a lot of experience in kind of various uh, settings as well, uh, clinical settings as well. And uh, prior to kind of becoming interested in this area of clinical work, um, I kind of took a deep dive for several years into psychoanalytic theory and practice, and so that's some of the background that I kind of Could you uh, hold the mic a little bit closer? Sorry, that's something that I kind of uh, uh, bring into that uh, uh, as well. So I'll just leave it at that. Hi, my name is Jane Latimer, and um, I have about 30 plus years experience working with trauma and eating disorder. Um, I have own, my own personal experience as well using um, psychedelics with the treatment of my own trauma, developmental trauma history, as well as in now assisting um, clients with uh, psychedelic integration work. And um, through the years have done <clears throat> a wide variety of uh, trauma-related trainings, including transpersonal, somatic, um, parts work, and um, basically have found in the past year that uh, psychedelic psychotherapy is one of the, the most uh, profound uh, treatments around for this issue. Fantastic. And panelists, there's two mics on the stage, so share them to, uh, to each, please. Uh, last housekeeping is we've got some sign-up sheets that we're going to be passing around uh, after the jar goes around uh, so that you can learn more about these events. So our friend Brooks will be doing that. Uh, so it's appropriate, Elizabeth, that you use the phrase uh, psychonaut um, because you are going to help us deliver the trip instructions uh, that we all need to understand, the, the rules of, of flight uh, for using psychedelics. So if you could speak a little bit to the disclaimers and the information we all need to know. Thank you, Charles. So I want everyone to understand here that while we're having perhaps a provocative conversation here this evening that none of us are here to condone or recommend the use of psychedelics. Now, Portland being what it is, the internet being what it is, we know you're guinea pigging on yourselves, at least some of you, right? Our goal in being up here is to have a stand for harm reduction, that you are informed consumers, that you know what you're undertaking, you know how to keep yourself safe, and maybe even know how to potentiate or empower the experience, okay? Um, I'd like to make an advisory statement, please, about um, not using this venue uh, here tonight, this public forum, um, to be uh, seeking a source of medicine. I want to have a serious pause to recognize that um, some of the work that people are doing in this community um, are definitely in the gray areas of the law. And as attorneys have been consulted on these matters, that's, that's the picture that they paint. And that you understand that means that people who are practicing supporting people um, in their informed consent and harm reduction around the potential use of entheogens, that this could be case law at any moment. Okay. Um, this is for educational purposes, and it's not intended to treat or diagnose anything. And we please, please ask that you would consult your health care provider um, before undertaking any changes to your health plan, including the use of psychedelics and as edgy of a conversation it may be. Thank you much. Uh, so where did this come from? Where are we today? There's a vast history of psychedelics that goes back um, into antiquity. There's a lot of use um, in the last hundred years for healing and insight. And Joe is going to walk us through um, where we've been and where we are today. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through this. Um, we really want to get to questions. And so we're, we're all going to try and make briefer statements than we might otherwise make. So there's, there's evidence that um, um, 
Peyote was, was uh, traded 5,000 years ago. Some of the symbols that we will have up here today are from caves um, in Algeria that was 4,000 years ago. Um, as far as we know, the, the, the mushroom cults in the Central Americas and the, the ayahuasca and other substances uh, used in the Amazon Valley um, have gone on for, for eons. Um, ibogaine in, in, in Africa, um, et cetera. So there's, there's ample evidence that, that in various cultures around the world, um, psychedelics or mind-altering substances have been used for as long as there have been humans, as near as we can tell. Bringing it up to the, to the more current um, situation, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church and the, and the political leaders crushed the mushroom cults in Central America, smashing all of the, the icons that they had. There were, there were small um, mushroom stones that were all over Central and South America, and they destroyed many of them, but there were a few hundred left, I guess. Um, coming up to, to our more modern times, LSD was uh, discovered by ha um, Albert Hoffman in, at um, Sandoz, 1938, 1943. He accidentally dosed himself and then um, deliberately dosed himself the second time and had a remarkable bicycle ride home that we now celebrate as Bicycle Day. Um, during the 50s, it was, oh, so Sandoz sent out millions, just millions of, of samples all over the world saying, we got something here, but we have no idea what to do with it. And any, anybody with any academic standing, whatever, was able to order millions of doses. And, and that's where some of it leaked out. Um, I remember when I was a, a youngster that people had Sandoz um, LSD available. Uh, the storyline, the way that many people understand what happened during the 60s was that LSD escaped the laboratory. There were like a thousand published um, articles, professional articles on LSD treatment and 40,000 people supposedly were treated with it during the 50s and 60s. Um, but once it broke out into the general public and people like Owsley started, started um, uh, selling high quality LSD on the street, um, something happened. I personally think it was a revolution. I'm unwilling to take the dominant argument that's now existing in academia at least, which was that the LSD escaping the lab caused the government to freak out and, and, and crush all research. Um, there was an article in Atlantic Harper's last year um, quoting Ehrlichman, Nixon's um, aide de camp, as it were, uh, that, that the whole war on drugs was, was essentially uh, Nixon's vindictive punishment against blacks and hippies and that it was just a, essentially a get back. And he's quoted as saying he never even believed the war on drugs. And they, neither did they believe that the war on drugs was real. Um, so in the late 70s, all research stopped. Um, and, and then they, they busted Owsley, who was producing most of the um, quality LSD. And everything sort of went underground. There was, in fact, uh, still a movement happening, but it was very um, underground. Leo Zeff is one of the people who kept it going. Goff, who was one of the original uh, psychotherapists, um, Freudian psychotherapists from the 50s, kept it going with holotropic breath work, some of it. Um, Esselin sort of kept it, it alive as well. But through the 70s, 80s, through the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, pretty much nothing happened in this country, and really not much happened around the world. The rest of the world followed the American DEA and, 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 and made all these substances illegal. 
um, but there were people like Doblin and, and uh, Griffith and others who had enough, um, I don't know, I'm not sure what the word would be, but were respected enough by the DEA that they were allowed to start very small experiments again with very needy, you know, we're, we're talking about anxiety in people with cancer, we're talking about PTSD, we're talking about uh, permanent depressions. These were the, these were the, um, the people that, that uh, got the initial um, research. Where we're up to now is that there is really first-class research happening on the effects of LSD and psilocybin and MDMA on um, depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, uh, a range of, of, of other things. These are happening in major institutions, um, NYU, Johns Hopkins, uh, Imperial College in England, um, and so forth. So MDMA is probably going to be the bust out one that, 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 that happens, and that may happen in the next couple of years that it's in stage three trials, and that's the last stage of FDA um, approval. The numbers they have are simply remark, you know, just astounding, and most people think that eh, in two years or so there will be legalized MDMA therapy for people with PTSD and available in in this city. Um, the other medications are probably going to take longer, and and getting them out for other things probably will take 10 or 15 years. So right now, the dominant storyline among the academic world and in the DEA as well is that Leary and Alpert, Leary and Ramdas, destroyed the whole, the whole um, venture of, of research um, by sharing it with, their, with the people they weren't supposed to share it with and breaking it out. Very much now, the establishment, the people who are actually working with these drugs, are terrified of that happening again. And so the, the licensing organizations have become very punitive, shall we say, to people who are openly doing work at the un, in the underground um, community. So. Most of the licensed people I know, if they're doing anything at all, they're doing it very, very, very under the table. They're not advertising at all. It's word of mouth. It's friend to friend. And most of them, you know, are just terrified to do it because it's, it's they don't the bar for you to lose your license and therefore your livelihood is pretty low. You know, the, they, the, they can just say, you're out, and, and you don't have a lot of recourse. Which is um, why it's so courageous that you guys have joined us here on the stage this evening. Well, three, I, three, of, three of us aren't licensed. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> um, it, it's still important to, you know, recognize that there are risks inherent, you know, in, in all of this. And I think that you, you do a good, a good job there. So right. thank you for that. Thank you. So I would like to turn our attention to the um, therapeutic uses and the, the various uses of entheogens. And Sean, uh, please walk us through um, what we characterize as the four types of psychedelic use, why people turn to these medicines. I guess if it's okay, oh, sorry, sorry. Me, uh, yeah, if, it, if it's okay, actually, um, I was also going to talk about um, kind of the, the difference between a guide and a, and a sitter. Oh, that's the next slide. Um, I think... You want to flip to able, them? Yeah, if we, if we could do that first, sure. I think it'd make a little bit more sense for the for the flow of the presentation. Um, so, because of the inherent, uh, because of the the just how powerful the psychedelic experience can be, and the uh, kind of an inherent unpredictability of it, um, it's it's really important that if you are going to use any of these substances, that you uh, that you do so in a safe manner. And and the the main thing to to think about in terms of making that safe is to have somebody 
uh, somebody to help you out, to, to be there with you in some manner during the experience. Um, and so we talk about uh, having a sitter or a guide. And um, these are, you know, these are not kind of like protected, defined terms or anything. These are kind of like loosely terms. So you might hear them used in somewhat interchangeable senses or, or used with kind of different definitions depending on who you're talking to. But the way that, that, um, that, I, that I and I think probably most of us here kind of agree in, in terms of how we would think about the, the distinction is that um, um, somebody who would be a sitter, somebody who would act as a sitter for you if you were using a psychedelic, uh, would not necessarily be someone who has uh, any sort of specialized training or experience, uh, although they probably should have had their own uh, experiences with any of these substances, these medicines, uh, to kind of have that first-hand knowledge of what can happen and, and how that can go in order to be of help. But um, generally, as somebody who is, who is acting as a sitter, their, their primary function is going to be uh, to kind of keep you physically safe, to kind of act to, 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 uh, in a harm reduction role. Um, <clears throat> To help you keep, to help ground you if you're having little difficulties staying grounded enough, to keep you from doing anything that could harm you or harm someone else, um, and probably also to kind of function a little bit as a kind of a personal assistant or a butler during the during the experience. Somebody that can maybe help you get some water if you need to, or help you get to the bathroom if you're unsteady on your feet, um, to answer the door if uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses show up at the wrong time. <laughs> so which you don't probably want to be dealing with that at that point in time. Or it might, for the, it might be the perfect time for them, I don't know. They get you in a very vulnerable open state, but anyway. Um, so so if they, those, those are kind of the, the functions that somebody who's acting as a sitter would, would serve. And again, it, it, could be, it could be a friend, it could be a, a, a spouse, a partner, it could be um, any number of folks, but again, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's got any sort of like specialized training, let's say. Um, and, and probably somebody who's not going to be necessarily doing anything to help you kind of, uh, I don't know, let's say get, get the most out of the experience. Again, this is not necessarily the case, but they're, they're really there just to kind of keep you safe. Um, and in contrast to that is, is, the, is to be in a role of a guide. Um, where a guide would probably be somebody who's had specialized training of some sort, which could be training in, in various kind of therapeutic modalities, or it could be somebody who's trained uh, in a shamanic tradition, for example, or somebody um, who, you know, who's had spiritual training, whatever the case, but, but presumably with, who also has had their own experiences with these medicines, who understands kind of how they go and what can come up and, and how to work with that. And they're, they're also going to be, um, they're going to be more equipped to uh, possibly to be working with you beforehand to figure out what you're wanting to get out of the experience, um, to kind of develop a, a, an idea, maybe a goal, an intention that you're going to be working with. Um, to prepare you, especially if you're not yourself experienced with any of these substances, uh, to kind of educate you on what what it can be like and what can come up and things to be, you know, on the lookout for. Um, and then, and then probably also afterwards, working with you in some capacity, in some form, to help you to integrate that experience, to help you understand it better, to. Um, to learn from it, to be able to apply it more, as fully as possible to your life afterwards. Um, so it's really about get, helping you uh, to get the most benefit out of the experience. Um, and then in the role of a guide, they would also be there during the experience. Also, first and foremost, providing that harm reduction and that safety function, keeping you safe, keeping you uh, to some degree grounded to keep you from acting maybe in a physical manner that might put yourself at, at risk of, of harm, um, to help if things become difficult for you, possibly to help you get through that um, through different techniques to help center you, ground you, um, and to work through whatever, you know, the anxiety, the fear, whatever the case is that, that, that's coming up. 
And um, just a moment. So are you ready to turn to why people um, uh, turn to psychedelics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay. And, and so, uh, again, these are, you know, we were kind of talking about what are the different reasons for which a person might use uh, psychedelics. Um, and these, these were kind of the categories that we thought sort of encompass most of it. And, and these also are not, uh, you know, these are not kind of like necessarily super distinct categories for the most part. There's certainly ways that they can blend in together and, and, and that a, uh, you know, a recreational experience can become a spiritual experience. A recreational experience can have therapeutic aspects that, that come out that you maybe had no intention of, of having, but that there they are. Um, a therapeutic experience can be very fun and uh, so on. So, um, but we kind of thought about these in, in terms of a couple different um, sort of categories and depending on what sort of you're going into it for, what your, what your goal is, that might affect whether you're looking for somebody who can just be there in the role of a, of a sitter or somebody who might be there in the role of, of a guide of some sort. Um, so, kind of first, I guess, is recreational, recreational use. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, that was certainly my first entry into this whole world was just recreational in, in high school, taking acid and probably not doing so in a super safe manner most of the time, but luckily mostly having pretty good experiences with it. Um, so this is just to have fun, to, to experience things in a, in a different way. Um, psychedelics can be fantastic for kind of bringing up, I don't know, the humor and the absurdity of, of kind of the way that people act and things that people do and, and to kind of laugh about things that you had never noticed could be funny before, for example. Um, and so this, if you, often, very often with recreational use, you're looking at kind of lower, uh, lower dosages and uh, unstructured settings. And so it can be very fun. It can be, it, you know, these can be great experiences, but this is also where people often, um, you know, often where the most trouble comes up because it isn't structured, because it might be in situations where you don't have control over the situation uh, necessarily and who you'll be in, interacting with and so forth. This is where, um, you know, sometimes people get injured or, you know, get into legal trouble or in very, you know, severe cases. I mean, there are, uh, you know, cases where people have died usually because they were acting in a way that put them at risk. They fell out of a building or something. So there are, there are risks, and, and most of the risks that come up with psychedelics are from that sort of unstructured use in maybe settings that aren't super friendly for, for the intensity of the experience that you're going through. Um, people will also use uh, psychedelics for problem solving, for creativity enhancement. Um, this is where often now you'll hear about people using microdosing, which is kind of a different area altogether, but um, using psychedelics to get a different perspective on a problem, on a creative problem or a, a problem in your work, for example. Um, and, you know, there's some, you know, from examples of, uh, you know, Steve Jobs was kind of very famous, uh, very well known for talking about how, uh, how much of an impact his use of LSD had had in helping him to think creatively and in, in coming up with Apple computers. Um, I forget which one it was, but one of the people that discovered the double helix uh, uh, structure for DNA apparently felt that that had come to, the, the understanding of the structure had first come to them in an LSD uh, experience. So um, <clears throat> then there's also people who will use psychedelics for spiritual growth and spiritual development. Um, these, this, uh, these substances can, especially in, in higher doses, um, produce profound mystical experiences um, that are indistinguishable from the mystical experiences uh, had by people who, you know, have practiced certain forms of meditation for, for many years or decades even, or, or other, you know, throughout history there's accounts of mystical experiences that are, that are really no different from what the right substance in the right setting can, can help you to, uh, to, to experience and to, and to realize. And, and so there are, as, as Joe uh, pointed out, of course, and as probably most of you know, there are 
Um, there are certain religious traditions, especially in the Americas and South America, for example, of ayahuasca. Um, there, there are formal churches that have, that have developed, especially in Brazil, that uh, use these, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> that, that have used these uh, as part of their, uh, their, their, uh, their religious beliefs. And, and so there are those, um, those uses, and then, and then psychotherapeutic use, therapeutic use, which is kind of where most of us are coming at this from to some degree, which um, is using them um, to help um, to help work through problems in life and uh, in understanding personal experiences, possibly working through traumas, as Jane will be talking about in a moment. Um, and there's a lot of there there was a lot of history of, of the use of psychedelics for therapeutic. Uh, 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 purposes through the 50s and 60s that showed a lot of promise and then was shut down for a while but is coming back now and, and um, I, I kind of don't want to go over time so I'll, I'll leave it at that. We'll probably be able to come back to that some but I'll, um, I'll pass it on now to, uh, to Jane. To Jane. So Jane, okay. you um, you can uh, take us from the therapeutic use and talk about how uh, people are are turning to the medicines uh, to deal with trauma, and uh, you gave a great talk on this. I hope folks were here for it a couple of weeks ago, so please take it away. Yeah, so um, I think that talk's supposed to be up on YouTube in a few days, hopefully. Um, yeah, so basically I want to talk about two things that we need to be aware of when we're going into journeying, um, specifically around trauma. Uh, working with trauma intentionally is one area that people can, are now becoming very interested in in terms of psychedelics. There's a lot of media um, publicity going on right now. And so people are running to psychedelics because of some of the treatment, lots of the treatment, the conventional treatment has failed. So some of you here sitting here may be here for that very reason. So you want, when you're, work, when you're thinking about going on a journey or working with a psychedelic entheogen, <clears throat> um, be aware uh, that you can work with it very intentionally. And that's what, essentially what I'm going to address. Um, the other factor is that what I'm calling the whoops factor, which is essentially that we decide we're going to go on a journey for whatever reason and we don't realize that we have a whole lot of trauma in our background and whoops, something goes wrong. So that's the whoops factor. So I want to address those two places. And the first thing I'm going to do is ask you all to think about this. What will you do if you or someone starts screaming, moaning, goes into a rage or a really dark place, starts trembling, is nauseous, may threaten to hurt themselves or hurt you, or begins to talk about some really dark stuff? So keeping this in mind, this could come up because, essentially, I'm going to read a quote, psychedelics pull out a person's fears, pains, delusions, shortcomings, and attachments, providing the opportunity to break through each block. And depending on how we deal with these blocks, they're either going to be opportunities for breakthrough or opportunities for breakdown. And what we want to do is hopefully create a setting, a set-in setting, so that these become opportunities for breakthrough. Um, so the first thing to know, I, whether you're looking for a guide or working with this yourself for guides, you want to be able to first have some sense of how do I assess if I have some trauma in my background so that I can be more aware of what I'm walking into. Um, there are plenty, there are many uh, trauma assessment tools online, so I'm not going to go into that. You can just Google that yourself. I want you to realize that um, don't assume that a high functioning person is not traumatized. So many trauma survivors are perfectionistic, workaholics, and successful in their day to day lives. High functioning can be used as an ego defense protecting deeply wounded parts that are hidden from view. You want to be aware of high states of anxiety or periods of depression and immobility. And if you suspect that you have issues in these areas, then you should be looking for a good trauma specialist or trauma therapist um, as a guide for your journey. And I would say rule of thumb is that individuals with trauma, 
should be seeing a therapist for at least minimum one to two months, if not a whole lot more, before actually embarking on a journey. There are certain skills that we have to um, know how to address in our own psyche before we blast it open with a psychedelic. All right, so some of the factors, we have safety factors, fear. I would suggest going in and asking yourself, well, how do I deal with fear? What am I most afraid of? How do I cope with it? How, how will I deal with fear and terror on my journey? So be thinking about that, bringing it up into awareness beforehand. Some of the things we can do on a journey, uh, touch, touch, touch your sitter, will ask for permission or should ask for permission beforehand. Is it okay if I touch you if, you're, if you get um, triggered? And um, of course the touch should be like a gentle touch on either, you know, on a foot or a shoulder or an elbow, something like that. Changing positions is helpful. Using mantras is very helpful. Soothing music, chants, spiritual affirmations, phrases like, I am here, you are safe and breathing techniques. You want to find out if the person that you're working with or you, if you are the voyager, have a solid support network. Do not go into a journey without a solid support network because when you come out of this journey, you want to have people that you can go to and turn to to help you should you need it. Um, the other thing you want to look for, and I, um, I always look for, and I tell my clients, is you want to look for home environment. So your home environment, what are you going back to after your journey? You may go somewhere else, you may go into a beautiful place in nature. When you go back home, who are you going to be with? Are they nurturing, honest, authentic people that you feel safe to disclose with? Or is it a scary place that you, where you have to stay defended? You also want the environment to be uncluttered, to be safe and nurturing for yourself. Um, some very specific tools to assess in yourself or if you're guiding is, do I have the capacity to step into a witness or an observer? Do I have the capacity to watch images, to kind of watch intense emotions and stay present to that without freaking out? Um, are you able to distinguish between your, what I call the true self, the inner critic or wounded parts? Can you regulate emotional states? Do you get overly, can you get overwhelmed easily and entangled in overwhelm, overwhelming feeling states and not know how to get yourself out of it? You want to know how to get a person present? Your sitter should know how to get you present if you lose it. Coming back to the room, looking around, again, touch is useful. And there are very specific phrases that can be used, such as, um, is it okay if I touch you on the shoulder? Or if things get really intense, um, you always have a choice. You have a choice as to whether you want to keep going with this or whether you want to open your eyes and come out of it. Given, depending on what it is, sometimes we don't have choices, but that's a big piece in the beginning when you're deciding whether you're, what kind of journey you want to go on, what kind of medicine you're going to use, is how much control do I want to lose? If I'm a trauma survivor, I may not want a complete ego dissolution experience. Um, I would suggest using more uh, lighter doses, doses that are going to help you work intentionally with what you're working with. Um, and I know I have to wrap up, so I just want to say something um, that really does need to be addressed before I close, and that is the somatic aspect. Trauma lives in the nervous system. So you want a sitter who can knows how to work. What happens if you start trembling, if you go into contractions, if you start sweating, if you're nauseous? So there are very specific ways to work with the body, body somatically during a journey that will be helpful and not so helpful and possibly even destructive. So um, we're not going to go, I can't, I don't have the time to go into those ways. But well, we can go into them in the Q&A at the end. Okay. So, so um, I, I'm going to put these notes if anybody wants to go into greater depth with what I've written here on my website. And you can get that from me later. Terrific. And Elizabeth, you're going to expand on uh, some of these ideas with relation to harm reduction and potentiation. Yes, thank you, Charles. So this is the portion of the discussion where we talk about if you've decided to take this on, what, what it seems to us you need to do to keep yourself safe, okay? 
clearly by our presentation tonight, we believe that having a sitter or a guide present is a way for you to keep yourself psychologically and physically safe. Let's talk next about what we mean by the set, the mindset of this set and setting phrase that we might uh, be introduced to in, in, in the conversation. So first of all, let's think about consent. By this, I, I see that there's evidence that people have done their deep homework, that they understand what it is that they might be partaking, whether it's the substance or the experience they might have or who should not have these, these sorts of experiences. And in our conception, a good guide is gonna be someone who can help you along that process of informed consent, right? I also see consent as um, uh, knowing what your rights are and being informed as to what we mean by cognitive liberty, okay? Um, one of the resources I did not get to add to our list, but I encourage you to check up is cognitive-liberty.org. Um, a second factor we might talk about in terms of our mindset would be that we have courage. This is, uh, this is a, an, a practice of reflection, of looking within, and it is best that you understand that you are undertaking something. You are potentially going to access what it is that you don't know you don't know. So be ready to be surprised. I like two sets of mantras referring back to Jane and, and, and self-care with a trauma history. Good medicine for any of us is to have a mantra and one of our, from our tradition used in the 50s and 60s when this was our best hope for psychiatric medicine was the mantra of breathe, relax, and let go. A more modern version might be surrender, accept, and appreciate. So these are the attitudes that we would encourage people to embody in terms of having the appropriate set um, to have a psychedelic experience. And then I add to that that people might occur as being highly determined, if not called, if that's not too woo of a word, that people feel called to have this experience and that they come to this of their own free will and volition. Um, I think it's also very important in terms of keeping yourself safe if you're going to have this experience to, if you're working with a sitter or a guide, to be ready to fully commit to accepting any guidance they feel they need to give you, right? And we can say this while we're here in consensus reality, and things can be a little different in that, in that psychedelic space. But being able to fully commit and, from consensus reality, I'm sober, I'm gonna accept any guidance that my sitter or guide gives me. You should know what the rule outs are. Certain people who should not, um, as we understand it, have this experience, it's likely to endanger your psychiatric well-being. And that would be a personal or family history of psychosis, psychotic disorders, or a personal history of bipolar disorder. I could say more about that, but I hope this is an invitation for, to all of you for where you might go do your homework. Okay. Um, you might also consider having what we call um, a, a parachute, meaning something that you could take in the class of benzodiazepines, that Xanax, Valium, Ativan, those sorts of things, if it's safe for you to do so, if you have a personal prescription. Just to know that you have that as a way to step out of the experience while understanding that a guide is likely to um, offer to you or invite to you that you stay with anything challenging that comes up, that they are there with you to help you, as Jane said, um, create a breakthrough and not a breakdown. It's also wise that you know um, the risks of this thing we call HPPD, Let's see if I can say it correctly, Hallucination Persisting Perception Disorder. Thank you. Slowly. In a web search of 2,600 people, 
roughly 4% of people reported something in the realm of this experience, if only temporarily. And it's basically, you kind of feel trippy after the drug has come out of your body. You might, tracers is what they used to call it in the 60s, okay? In, um, in, a, in a medical study that my business manager cited, the rate was actually 0.66%. Uh, but I want people to know this is a rare occurrence, what it could entail, and know the risk that you're taking them before you take them. Um, other ways to keep yourself safe, of course, are to uh, attend to what it might be to prepare for all of this, all these things that I'm outlining. Um, to attend also to setting, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in our conversation about what potentiates or empowers a psychedelic experience. And then also a plan for integration. Um, I'd also like to call us up on the resource list that we have of these websites um, that we can do your homework. And we'll show that at the very end. Um, are you ready to move into uh, Joe's competencies? My competencies. Yeah. Um, as <laughs> you are finding a guide, um, there are certain competencies for psychedelic therapists that Janice Phelps has, um, has discussed, and Joe's going to walk us through them. So, so in, in my research, actually, it was pretty hard to find um, any listing of these things, and, and they get pretty woo-woo pretty fast. And so I'm just going to go through them quickly. There are two um, brochures over there, or two printed, um, one that calls itself a manual, the other uh, is a, is a, a paper that, that uh, somebody wrote. The paper is by uh, Janice Phelps, and I think the manual is mostly James Fadiman. Um, those are available online. If you want more information, that's where I would go. Um, also, Fadiman's book, the one that's on the Exploring Psychedelics, I think it's called. So in two um, minutes, Joe. I'm sorry? Two minutes. You got two minutes on this. Okay, so. I'm doing, moving quickly. So... Um, one of the lists that um, I found, oh, oh, Phelps, this is Phelps. The first quality is empathetic, abiding, 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 I'm sorry, presence. The ability to be present with the individual throughout the experience. Um, psychedelics are often very suggestible and what the other person in the room does has a huge effect. Even their mental state of the other person in the room can make a difference. Where, what they're thinking about, what they're doing, it's, it's amazing. I know it sounds pretty woo-woo, but it's true. So the ability to be present with the, the person, the ability to enhance trust, um, both trust in, in the therapist but, or the guide, but also trust that the individual can, can work with her, him or herself, that, that the answers to these things are available to the person. You know, so trusting their own experience and mostly getting out of their way while they're having it, helping them through the difficult moments, but mostly staying out of your way. It's why I'm, I'm a little iffy about the guide thing because mostly they're doing it on their own. A person needs to have spiritual intelligence to understand spiritual uh, phenomenon and to, you know, you don't have to believe in anything, but you, you have to at least be able to, to talk about it. Um, knowledge of the physical and psychological effects of, of the substances, and then um, therapist self-awareness and ethical integrity are the kind of the hallmarks of what you're looking for. What I would say, I'm finishing up, what I would say is most important is most of us, I think maybe all of us, are willing to meet with you beforehand um, and have a conversation, and you need to decide whether you can trust this person. And because that's what you're going to need is um, somebody you can trust. Thank you. And so now you're all um, primed to be thinking, okay, if this is for me, then where do I go from here? but there's some ethics and some etiquette that we need to consider when pursuing a guide or when considering uh, performing a uh, service for others. So Elizabeth, if you could speak to the uh, ethics and etiquette issues. Thank you. 
So one of the things I would like to be clear about is that you should not ask um, a, a sitter or a guide for source and yet you should also be willing to share everything you know about your source, including if you don't have one. So fully transparent with your sitter or guide as to what's going on. Uh, a source of medicine, right? We've seen it happen that people are like asking directly in these public venues like, hey, where do I find some, right? So that's a conversation to be had in private. And if you're going to work with a sitter or a guide, be fully transparent with them about where you are around that. But please don't ask people, particularly someone who represents as a sitter or a guide, to source for you. Okay? Um, also agreeing to accept a sitter's guidance. I think we mentioned that earlier. This is part of what also keeps us, anybody who's doing this sort of work in the world for people. Um, if you think you have found a guide or a sitter that's reputable and you want to talk about them, please ask your sitter or guide what their referral system is. You understand this is a moment to be discerning, and yet it's about not necessarily what you know, but who you know. Um, do your homework as you're asked to prepare yourself. Um, come of your own free will. These are things that are protecting the people who might stand up for you and do this sit or guide work with you. Okay, um, be ready, as I said before, to defend your cognitive liberty. And uh, a little minutia detail that I've learned recently is as wise if you provide the space where this is going to occur. Okay? Okay. I, I, just, I just wanted to add, um, don't approach a possible sitter by email or even phone, and don't ask... I hear that you do psychedelic sitting in your email that puts sitters at risk. Be discreet. So this gets us to the uh, point right before we can um, go into audience questions where I'd like to ask the panelists to just spend a minute or two at most talking about integration in this process and then we will integrate all of your feedback and questions into our discussion. So, uh, Joe, will you kick us off on your thoughts on integration? Well, you know, I work in a, or at least I have worked, I am shortly ending it, but for the last 16 years I've worked in a, an urgent walk-in clinic. And, and we get everything from teenagers with their first breakup to people who are so psychotic that they are talking in word salad and, and everything in between. And, and what over the years I've, I've figured out to do is to figure out where people are, join them where they are, hear their story, and then, because I only see them once, and then attempt, first of all, let them know they've been heard, but then attempt to help them to at least consider another story, some other way to understand the circumstances. What psychedelics do is, as Elizabeth's favorite phrase, they're like the, the snow, snow, globe. snow globes. And it's like you shake up the snow globe and, and then um, everything falls down in a different place. And integration is about helping people to look around at where things fell and to make a new story, to understand themselves in a slightly or very radically different way. Um, and and the, the psychedelics allow for that story changing. And to me, that's what integration is. It's about, it's about taking whatever your experience was looking at how you're feeling a week later or a day later and, and, and say, and then trying to make sense out of it, make a new story. And the important thing about that is that, is that it has to be the person making the story. I can make suggestions of what might work, but it, it, it's the individual who is going to live with this story. And I, you know, there are many parts of psychedelic medicine that 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 happen there's there's biological changes that happen in the brain but i'd say 50 percent of it is making that new story 
And those that's, are great that's insights. That's what my integrate, what I understand integration. Those are great insights. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, in terms of integration, I highly recommend having um, some highly dedicated uh, post-trip self-care days, if not just a single day. Really believe in clearing the day before, the day of, and the day after. I recommend an ongoing practice with a trustworthy other where you can be seen and known and reflected back to with love. Um, an ongoing personal practice of reflection. I highly recommend meditation. I recommend finding a way to regularly move the body, referring back to Jane's wisdom around somatic experiencing and trauma recovery. And I also recommend a, a, a regular practice of gratitude and giving back. Um, I don't know that I have a whole lot maybe to add to what's already been said. I mean, I think that, that um, you know, I think that there are, there are different ways that, that one can think about integration, different ways that one can integrate these experiences, and there's not like a specific single uh, uh, correct way. It could be, it could be through ongoing uh, psychotherapy, talk therapy, it could be through these other modalities, but it, it is, um, you know, I think if, if you've had a profound psychedelic experience, which you know, hopefully the experience you had was profound and it was, and it did really kind of alter your, your perceptions and give you a new outlook. Um, kind of being able to get the most out of that new, uh, that new perspective, getting the most out of that experience, being able to apply it <clears throat> in your life going forward. Um, you know, it's, it's not always easy. It takes, it takes some work. Um, one can have a very profound transformative experience. And then I think inevitably what, what, most of us knows happens whatever the whatever caused that experience is that the the effects can tend to fade over time and we we tend to go back to whatever our baseline was and if you really are seeking personal change it takes effort to build on that initial opening and to uh, to build on that and to, to 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 nurture it so that it will that it will last and that it will uh, really lead to, to longer term change rather than just kind of a brief, uh, maybe a brief respite from your neuroses or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but to really get lasting change takes ongoing work um, of, of whatever sort you find really works best for you. Okay, so um, along the lines of, of this focus on trauma, I think integration begins with preparation. It's not just an after, it's actually a before. So that when, before you go out on the journey, you have some real deep skills in place. And then those skill buildings start in the beginning, they can be utilized during the journey, and then they continue after the journey. Things like, how do I deal with triggers when I'm gonna have a meltdown? Um, how do I deal with feelings? How do I deal with overwhelm? How do I deal with, um, Addictions, addictions that I'm dealing with, um, taking care of myself, putting self-soothing skills in place, having strong boundaries, how to say no. I have to say no to the world that I was living in because I'm coming into a new world. I better know how to say no. Um, and then we talked, as others have talked about, um, do you know how to create a new reality? I mean, once you see a reality, how you bring that reality the new reality into your everyday, um, ordinary life. So having some of those skills as well. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of resources that we're going to post on the, um, the Portland Psychedelic Society Facebook and Meetup pages. So you do not need to write all of this stuff down uh, now. But uh, a lot of these are derived from the Tripper's Guide to an Awesome Ride, which is an excellent, uh, I think, 12-page resource. Um, about uh, this area. Uh, so I'm going to leave that up for just a minute or two uh, and then return to some of the wonderful art by uh, William Floyd who provided a lot of the art for this. But now it's time to integrate your questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes so we're going to put a premium on questions. So um, please try to do a little bit less personal sharing, a little bit more questions about your experience for our experts on the panel. So uh, who's got some questions out there? With, with clients that are dealing with trauma, what compounds have you seen them experience the most growth with?
don't all grab the mic at no. once. No. <laughs> you, you know, I haven't worked with trauma, so I can't say it from my personal experience. But from the readings, I mean, what what is being what is showing the most success right now is MDMA. Um, and, and the people who are working, and I don't work with that substance, the people who, who do work with that substance tell me that they believe that it's the, the reduction of the, the lizard brain, the, the amygdala, that, that, that it gets quieted, and the, 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 the power of the reactivity is diminished, and that's, what, that's a, a large component of why it's successful. Okay, so I'll add, since Joe threw that out. Yes, I agree. And um, the thing about MDMA is that there's a lot more control in the session. So that, again, when you're working with trauma, you can do inter psycholo It's really no different, I wanted to say this before, not very much different than working one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. Um, the only difference is that it goes way deeper, much faster, so you can make huge headway in a very short period of time with that substance, but you're still doing the same kinds of interventions that you would do in a, in a regular therapeutic environment. Perhaps a good color to this question as well is because there are different compounds and different medicines, if somebody can kind of go over some of the, the modalities that are working as well. I'm familiar with how psilocybin works in people, and what I might say about how it appears to work is that there is a loosening of our ego state. Ego is often collapsed. We can hardly see around it. And that it is worthwhile for people who have a lot of defenses. And we need to kind of come in and really um, kind of flood the experience and pull the ego back here, if not kind of excuse ego for the afternoon. So that's how I see psilocybin working with trauma. I know most of the research right now is focusing on MDMA. Um, um, in the anecdotal um, arena, I have a friend who's dealing with trauma who um, has used both Ibrogaine and Ayahuasca, found them both very, very helpful. Those are medicines that have a reputation of being, um, they grab you and shake you a little more. They don't let you go in quite the same way that, that psilocybin or MDMA might. Um, and, and so to me, they're for the the braver psychonauts who are out there. But she found both of them extremely helpful and has, has made some pretty remarkable um, progressions um, using those two substances. Sean, do you have anything to add or we should go to the next? Okay, other questions out here? Uh, yeah, down front and then you and then we'll move to that side. Cool. So I guess I was just really wondering, I mean, I can understand why someone with schizophrenia should stay away. Oh, sorry about that. I can kind of understand where someone with schizophrenia should stay away from psychedelics, but with all the headway that's being made with anxiety and depression, um, do you have a really a powerful basis for why bipolar disorder should not be uh, begun to be at least treated? Or like, like, so the question is why bipolar disorder should not be used yeah. with psychedelics. Okay, thank you very much. I'm citing uh, Dr. James Fadiman, F-A-D-I-M-A-N, his, his suggestions. He's been uh, tracking thousands and thousands of microdosers, and, uh, and this is his recommendation upon what he's seen in a very large population size. So just to cite my source. You know, in, in, in the reading I've done, we're profoundly ignorant. We're, we're profoundly... Um, at the very earliest stages of, of using these substances, I think in, in, in due time, we might find a very, very useful uses for the psychedelics in treating all of the mental illnesses. Um, I think Pollan's book sort of makes some suggestions about how that is. Right now, I don't know anybody who's competent to do that, to take those risks. Maybe there's somebody out there who, 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 who has had enough experience working with these substances and, and, and with those illnesses. But it, it, it's not like, it's just right now it's not wise, given what we know. Uh, next question. Um, yeah, just in terms of MDA, uh, MDMA, Michael Pollan's book, he sort of sets aside MDMA and talks about psilocybin and LSD. Could you make the clarification? Because I have sort of now a judgment about MDMA and thinking that 
psilocybin, LSD, which I've experienced, um, take away the ego, you know, you can dis dissolve the ego state and so on, whereas MDA is more of a body, sort of a physical thing, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. Okay. Thanks for your question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, certainly it, it, with the, in Michael Pollan's example in the, in the book, part of it was that he had medical issues that, that um, made him uh, especially wary to deal with MDMA. And I think that, that um, certainly uh, with MDMA, there are uh, potentially greater, there's a greater physiological impact. And so there's more of a kind of a concern for uh, that coming up as opposed to uh, psilocybin or LSD, which um, psychologically can be much more intense in an experience, but uh, physically have much less risks. Um, and then, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think that they're, 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 they are both can be very, um, if we think of kind of the, the uh, LSD, psilocybin, possibly ayahuasca as, in, in, as one category, and then MDMA as something similar but slightly different, they, they do different things and they can work, they can both be very effective, um, but in different ways. And I think, um, for one, I think that with MDMA, because it is, uh, psychologically, it's much gentler. Um, for some people who maybe don't have a lot of experience previously with psychedelics or who are, um, you know, have a lot of anxiety or trepidation about um, what could come up, that it could, be, it could be a lot easier and feel safer and a good kind of entryway into that to use the MDMA as opposed to these others. Um, and um, I think... Um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I do think that they can just kind of do, they can work in very different different ways. And I think there's a certain kind of processing that can happen with MDMA that's very similar to what could happen, as Jane mentioned, in, in, in kind of more traditional talk therapy. Um, but I think it's um, it's rare to get the sort of uh, uh, sort of ego dissolution or the or the kind of very profound sort of spiritual experiences that could be had with these other substances. And so some of it, I think, comes down to as well kind of what a person is, is looking for, what their intentions are, and, and um, what they think would be most helpful towards, towards reaching that. So, anybody? Briefly, and then just, we'll go to the next just, question. I, I would just like to... Um, the other thing with MDMA is that um, there are a lot of adulterants that are, that are out there, and, and um, the people I talk to say that it is difficult to... to um, be sure that you're getting a quality product that that isn't adulterated in some fashion, and that creates a whole other set of issues. I just wanted to mention that. Be really careful about where you source your MDMA. That's a good place to inject. Uh, how do people uh, test about Dance Safe, or you know, could, could somebody speak to that? We have a Dance Safe um, person of 10, 10 years has been working in Dan Sace who, who recently told us that there is no safe set of tests. That there are 30 different kinds of fentanyl, for instance. No, no, but the question is how do people test their own substance? Oh, I have no idea. You can get test kits from dancesafe.org, but I think it's also important to understand that each test is testing for something different, and you don't always know what you're looking for. It could be cut with something that you don't know to test for. Thank you. There's a question down here. This gentleman. Uh, I've got a question uh, concerning if you're interested in becoming a guide or a sitter. Um, are apprenticeships known to be done? So you can watch somebody who's got experience doing this before you actually uh, take it on yourself. Is there Hogwarts for psychedelics? <laughs> There's a conference in uh, Victoria, B.C. in October of this year called Psychedelics and Psychotherapy. Okay. So, I, I do have a couple of quick bullet points on things that I would like anybody who's going to take on sit work, what they should ask themselves. Would that be, would that be powerful for me to speak to? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the framework for any, any sort of work like this is that you can relate to another human being with what we call unconditional positive regard or unconditional love. It's just our nerdy clinical word for it. Um, that you can be completely non-judgmental and aware where your bias might come up and know how to set that aside. 
and that you can relate to that person with compassion, meaning that you are listening for two things, feelings and what people want, need, or value. Um, you need to know, as Joe said, how to show up and get out of the way. Sounds paradoxical, it's, it's, a middle, it's a middle way. You need to know how to maintain calm in any crisis, any crisis. You need to be highly discerning as to when to hold it or fold it, if you will. I mean, there's a time where you might need to make a move to, be, to keep someone physically safe. Do you know how to discern that? Have you been clear with the person that that's your responsibility? And are you at peace in your being about having to do that? Because no one wants to. Are you able to be completely free of any distractions or time limits? Um, and are you in a practice of receiving support? And do you know how to take care of your own self, like good self-care? Okay, great. One more on this side, and then we'll go to that side. Is there one down here? Okay, since Hara, you're next on this side. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak to the range of fees for sitters Can't hear you. and guides. I was wondering if you can speak to the range of fees for sitters and guides. The range of? Fees, what you would pay a sitter or a guide. Ah, uh, fees. Maybe Filthy it's, lucre. Maybe it's my, my wasp background, but I would... Does anyone here want to speak to that here in a public setting? I, yeah, I bl blame it on the wasp. Sorry, guys. So this talk is, privately. This is being discreet. I think basically it's going to go from zero, what I've heard, zero to $1,800, I've heard, in California for therapists who are working or sitters, or professional guides. That's what I've heard. I haven't heard more than that. For one journey. Okay, down front, the uh, lady in the white shirt. Can you speak to uh, the range of recommended dosage for occasioning mystical, a profound mystical experience in psilocybin and LSD? Back to Brooks. Um, I couldn't speak to LSD. It's been a long, long time. Um, but with psilocybin, it depends a lot on the on the variety of mushroom that you have. Um, I assume, and, uh, when they're doing these studies that you hear about at uh, NYU or whatever, they're actually using synthetic psilocybin that's being produced in a in a very tightly controlled lab. Um, but you're not going to come across that. You're going to be almost certainly coming across actual mushrooms that somebody has either grown or, or found. And so it depends a lot on what type of mushroom it is. Um, most of the mushrooms that, are, that one finds sold on the black market are, are different strains of cubensis, psilocybe cubensis, where generally I think it's four to five grams is kind of the, the ego death... Uh, Full mystical experience dose, but it also depends a lot on the on the person. It can depend on how fresh the mushrooms are. There's a lot of factors, so it's hard to really say for sure. Okay. And the it's possible that someone more in the guide realm is going to know about things like helping you dial that in and booster doses and potentiation with things like cannabis and all sorts of other sorts of factors. All right, we have time for one or two more. So right here. Hi, thank you. Um, I've been he hearing a lot of uh, research being done about with ketamine, and I was wondering if you had any opinions on that. Thank you. Helen is next. Uh, we had a doctor who um, is opening, I think, a clinic here in Portland, was it? Uh, speak at one of the peers, um, the Portland Psychedelic Society. Um, uh, meetings, and, and he brought a client down. Um, what I've heard um, is that it's uh, something in the range of 60% is, is a success rate in, in helping people. Uh, this doctor brought down a, um, a client who, for whom it was, it was world-changing, you know, for her. She had been depressed forever, and uh, the ketamine treatment had really been wildly successful for her, but I'm under the impression that it's, it's not true for everyone. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could say, having had personal experience with that, that um, it, for one, it's, it, 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 at least in my experience, is very different from these other substances. It's very distinct from MDMA. It's very distinct from psilocybin or LSD. Um, it is a very interesting and, and I, I thought, like, really neat experience. Um, and it did have um, a really very marked impact um, in terms of improving my mood from kind of right after lasting for not that long, maybe for a few days or a week, there's a very noticeable difference that then fades pretty quick. And, and it's, it's interesting because ketamine, I think unlike these others, um, that that benefit, the therapeutic benefit, seems to be largely something that's happening just in a kind of biochemical, neurochemical way. It's not that you are having an experience necessarily and kind of having insights or seeing things about yourself or your relationships that, that improves it. It's something that's happening, that's, that's not something about kind of having that experience and, and seeing things, but just kind of at a neurological level, something changes. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left, so we're gonna go into the lightning round. Uh, Helen, you are first, and this gentleman is next. Uh, because of Michael Pollan's book and so many new people here, I wanted to bring up something really important about the psychedelic community compared to like a bike club or a book club. And that's that because of, uh, there are so many of us dealing with wounds and traumas and um, stuff like that. This scene also draws uh, some very predatory people. So when you're looking for a guide, please keep in mind that there are people out there who are textbook sociopaths, textbook narcissists. They're here in Portland. They're not just down at the ayahuasca circles in Peru. They're, they're all over. Um, it, take a moment to acquaint yourself. They're, the good thing about them is they're textbook. So take a moment to read up on what to look for because they're usually very charming, very seductive, very attractive, um, hypnotic almost. And, and so this isn't to say that someone who's nice and charming is a sociopath, but people Avoid have, Malfoys. <laughs> um, a lot of, a, a number of people have been hurt. I've seen people have hurt, especially with MDMA. You're extremely suggestible. People have been manipulated in those states. So just don't live in paranoia or fear, but keep that tucked away that that's out there. The greater the light, the greater the darkness it attracts. And Predators look for blood, you know, so if you're wounded, you're a little bit vulnerable in that sense. All right. So. Thank, thank you, Helen. We've got this gentleman here and then on this okay. side. Uh, this is, I'm going to dial back on. And lightning round questions, please. Dial back on the charm here. I have to leave at 845, but I, if anybody is interested, I do have extensive experience with ayahuasca in uh, Colombia and uh, elsewhere. And I'd be more than happy to talk about that with... Uh, okay, thanks. We have I a volunteer to speak after. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions, please. Uh, question on this side. Uh, hello. Uh, if we're not supposed to call or email about guide information, what's the best way to go about uh, getting in contact with a guide to get that information? You can, you can call and you can email. You just can't mention certain sensitive words. So you could say, I'd like more information about your work, about your training, about your intensive journeys. Those are good, safe words to use. Um, I offer face-to-face -face consultations for those sorts of uh, delicate conversations. They still need to get a hold of me, yes. And I have a card down there. And stop me here. Anybody else on the panel have a comment before we go next? Do you have a comment? I'm, 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 uh, I don't do anything else but this now. I'm otherwise retired. So if you call me up, I know what the subject is. Are you quitting from supervising me? <laughs> All right, we have time for one or two more quick questions. Is there another quick question down here? Anybody? Okay, uh, you've already spoken, so let's go to the back. Yeah. Are there any uh, problems with SSRIs and these medicines? And should we, if we're using them, kind of taper off before? So the question is SSRIs and entheogens. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, certainly, I. I don't necessarily know this from direct experience, but certainly what I've heard is that if somebody is taking an SSRI, that it will <clears throat> um, dramatically, if not completely, eliminate the effects of most uh, psychedelics and MDMA. 
Um, and so you would need to no longer be taking the SSRI for a period of time before you'd be able to use those substances and, and get a real effect. I don't know how long that is. I know that getting off of them can be um, difficult for some people. That there are sort of withdrawal symptoms that, that come up. And, um, and that, um, I was going to say something else, and, 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 and it's something that you would really want to, um, you know, work on in cooperation with whoever's prescribing it in the, in the first place. Um, I mean, I've worked with people just in my normal private practice therapy work who try to get off SSRIs and just have a hell of a time doing so, and it taking a very long time. So um, it is something to consider. I mean, I think there might be even some health risks if you do take one of these in addition to an SSRI, um, serotonin syndrome. Um, and I also recently found out that if somebody is taking trazodone, um, which is not an SSRI, it's a, it's, a, it's a different class of medication that's used as an antidepressant as a, and as a sleep aid, that taking that the day before you take uh, psilocybin in, in this particular case will completely block the psilocybin the next day. So, well, Let's let the panel finish and then we can go. I just want to add that don't be afraid to, if you have a medical professional. I mean, a lot of medical professionals are, are up to date on a lot of this stuff. I mean, not everybody is, but don't be afraid if you're working with a psychiatrist or a doctor to just go up front and say, hey, I want to do this. Is this okay? So, yeah, the, the SSRIs take a while to get out of your system. Some take a couple of weeks. Uh, Prozac takes six weeks. It's the half-life of six weeks, so, which means your, your blood level goes down by half in six weeks. So it, it's not absolutely essential, but it's wise. I'm not sure I would, I would work with somebody who was still taking SSRIs. Do you have anything? Okay, is there anybody that has not spoken in the audience yet that wants to ask a question? Okay, so go ahead. And briefly, please. I was on SSRI for a number of years, uh, tried psilocybin after that, tried um, uh, acid, um, many acid trips, nothing. Nothing happens. It, 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 it kills the uh, serotonin. And it has taken me, I had to wean myself two milligrams a, mo a month. And it took me eight months to get off of this serotonin, this SSRI. And okay. now I am just beginning to feel uh, something. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay. We have, is there one final question in the audience? Okay, thank you much. Before we break, I would like to share some upcoming events that are happening uh, here in Portland with the Portland Psychedelic Society. Uh, coming up at the end of this month, we have Hacking You, the Future of Psychedelics, featuring Preston Temple. Uh, soon we will have compounds that will help us reconcile with our deceased loved ones, experience um, unity with our partners. Thanks to advances in neuroscience, chemistry, and genetics, Preston Temple, a scientist and entheogenic researcher, will be speaking on that here at the Paris Theater on July 26th at 7. On July 29th, we're going to have an elders meetup at Open House at 2 p.m. So uh, elders working 45 and up uh, working with entheogens are welcome to come join us. Uh, coming in September, we're going to have Paul Stamets at the Newmark Theater. Uh, those tickets will be going on sale at the end of this month. And then in October, we're going to actually have a full day conference featuring uh, Dennis McKenna and other great experts. So please sign up for notifications at the Portland Psychedelic Society on Meetup or Facebook. Dot com. You can also sign up on our mailing list, uh, speak to our great volunteers and founder over at the uh, booth on the side. Uh, one last opportunity for you to go to the bar, get a drink, tip your bartenders. Remember, we get this space donated, so please, one drink minimum we ask for, and it's not too late to do that drink. Uh, thank you to our great panel tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, so please do stop by the front, grab cards, browse books, and uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight.